Hello, everyone. All right, then. I've just found out what's happened, so we'll go back to the beginning again. So, I have been answering questions. I'm not sure if you've heard them, though. Uh, this is going to be an interesting thing. Have you heard the answer to questions I've been doing? Uh, let's see. Has this been behind it? Or is this going to start from the beginning? That is always the interesting question. Yes, it started from the beginning. Hello. Hello, everyone. Let's see. Has this started from the beginning? Or has it been going... Has it, is it, are you now half an hour behind me? I will find out, hopefully, in a second when I go to this. Battle of Cape Passaro. Hello, everyone. Right then. I apologize, and I'm going to go back to the beginning because what I've just realized it's done. Battle of Cape Passaro. Is it's literally not been going out, and I do apologize. This has all been on me, definitely. <laughs> Oi, caramba. Hello, everyone, for starters. Hello, Adrian Pantgana. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Angus Sonnell. Um, SS Vince in the pool. I'm very glad to hear you have been looking for pictures, but that's one of the reasons why I want to go to the joyous thing that is... Um, uh, that is... All Souls College Oxford for a visiting fellowship. My application goes in tomorrow. So I can spend some time hunting around and hopefully perhaps one of the camera happy diplomats took a photo of her. Hello, Jane Inglis. Hello, Daniel Freeman. Hello, Angus Sonnels. Hello, and happy. Hello, Angus Sonnel on Mysteries of Deep. I hope there's going to be more episodes. Ten was in the series, but I hope there are going to be more. Um... I've been having fun. I thought I was talking to everyone and chatting away, and it turns out I wasn't. So I do apologize. I have been fine. I have been chatting away for half an hour and answering questions and carrying on as I normally do and not realizing no one could see me. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. All right. I press, as I normally do, the go live button on the system in YouTube. And then I went through and set up the go live on the XSplit broadcaster. And it seems to have, and I do not know why, have decided to turn off the previous one in the time it took me to turn on the other one. And there they are. It hasn't gone back to start from the beginning, so I have gone back to start from the beginning.
And you can all thank the person who figured this out and who realized what was going on is my very wonderful girlfriend. So, um, excuse me, quick message to her. Thank you. There you go. <sighs> Seriously, I would be, that, that, that girl keeps me sane. It, without her, yeah, yeah. So it'll be going to pot. Right then, let's go back and start other questions. We are 30 minutes behind. I am, well, you know, I was here half an hour ago and that's, that's yeah, started minutes ago, two minutes ago. I don't know. I'll go back to the questions. Right. So, we've been having a nice discussion about cavalry officers, and frankly, I do agree. Rupert was a cavalry I You see, this is one of the interesting things, because I was getting involved in the discussion over the cavalry officers. I was searching away quite happily about the cavalry officers. <laughs> and Prince Rupert, yes. Um, I'm not really sure um, at Waterloo if anyone uses their cavalry that well, though I have to admit, after what I've said. And there are some really good points. Um... RF4, I'm beginning to think that Dr. Clark needs to burn more incense and change literally to do a missile. He chooses before every live studio to uh, stream to prevent problems. Today, everything was working barring a single button on micro on YouTube, so... God help me! I Sorry. Oh, yeah. Tech Seal is an interesting battle, though, and I... I'm perhaps wondering if it was... Uh, perhaps it was the spirits of Deruta and Trump. Probably Trump. The Ruta doesn't really care about it. But Trump was probably, the spirit of Trump was trying to interfere with the publication aid because I'm going to talk about Bucket and how well he did. <laughs> Alright then, so. Worst things happen at sea. That they do. I'm sorry I'm half an hour behind. I'm actually not half an hour behind. I've been talking to you all for half an hour, but you couldn't hear me. <laughs> oh, I don't know. You can either laugh or cry, but at least I don't have Mistress of the Deep to pop to tonight, so I can spend a lot of time with you guys. And it's a bit hot for the puppy dog to go out. Unless the rain start early. If the rain start early, then he won't be going out because it'll be too wet. But it's been too hot to take him out during the day. And it could be too wet to take him out tonight. So, I've told some. Dr. Clark, I've seen hope the chat's going. Sorry, we're going to run back in now. Looking forward to watching this evening. Take care, Fair Stafford. Well, what I see, the thing was, I was watching and the viewers was going up as well. So I thought you must be seeing me because the viewers are going up. But, um, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a laugh or cry scenario and I'm going to choose to laugh. Right. So the Battle of Texiel is one of those fun battles which shows you why the, fir uh, the Third Anglo-Dutch War needs to be studied far more. Um, it also shows why there were so many problems going on in this sort of war scenario because you, the choice of leaders you have, this entire battle should be taught to people. I don't care what you, who are going to business or anything, uh, to to show them about how not to lead and command and organize the nation. Um, you have a fairly good administrator. Apparently, I owe my girlfriend some egg custards now. So, you know. Um, you have a fairly good administrator who's a fairly good politician in Prince Rupert. He's not a good admiral, though. He's not a good general, really, is he, either. Uh, but he's a marginally better general than he is better admiral. It's Jesse, like, our scintillating discussion was drawing him in. I'm sure it was. The funny thing was, I thought I was contributing to that discussion. <laughs> Oh. 
I will do one next time seeing her. I will make sure I uh, where whenever I next see her, it'll be um our egg custards will be brought. So although I've been promising some egg custards for a while, how am I them? Uh, first things first, I'm going to do, um, because Drac and Jamie will tell me off if I don't, because I'm supposed to be professionalizing to an extent, because they both seem to find it more annoying, my economic scenario, of the fact that I have all these jobs, and then they all disappear over the summer months, especially when, well, now with COVID, they all disappear completely, but, you know, um, the, all these, le these sort of posts, which really require quite a lot of me in lecturing terms, disappear for two months of the year to save them in contract employment issues. And, um, well, they keep, t they will tell me off if I don't do this. So please do like, share, subscribe if you are enjoying. It's always a pleasure. And I hope you're enjoying these things. As you know, I have been taking, I suppose I have been taking the, um, the channel in a slightly more broader route than it started out of. It started out very much on sort of the World War II period and sort of the interwar period because that's what I was focusing on because that was what I was writing about at the time. But now I'm not in the middle of writing a book. I can be more expansive. I can devote more time to research. I don't have to rely so much on my own knowledge and even on my books. I can go and hunt stuff out in terms of what sources are out there on the internet and what things I can go and track down on JSTOR. I have to say the biggest surprise to me, and this is something which we're probably going to be discussing in Bilge Pumps at some point, but in good news for Bilge Pumps, we have got a special guest coming to record of us next week. Commander Salamander. Now, I know you're all, some of you are going to be sitting there going, who is this? Okay, he's a Twitter personality in many ways, but he's also an ex very experienced in terms of his analysis of ships and all these things going around, and he's a very influential voice in terms of the social media world of the naval discussions. And frankly, we're all fans of him. Big fans. And so he's coming on Bilge Pumps, and we're looking forward to that. So we're going to be doing the future of warship design next week. Like this week, we did China. Well, no. That was, that's come out this week. Next week comes out Beirut and Turkey and Greece. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's the week out. It's always fun because you record it one, we record it on the Tuesday, and then the next week, last week's comes out the day after. So we always record it about eight or nine days before it comes out. Danny Hume, didn't MacArthur think he was an admiral and wanted to command amphibious operations? Many, many, many things did uh, did MacArthur think. And by the way, Daniel, I'm going to probably be sending you an email um, later to check if you'll have any free time tomorrow. I'm thinking that we might do a discussion for the Crete thing. Uh, um, mainly because... The I did an early recording of an introduction to Crete this morning, and it sounded like I was, um, well, I kept putting on a second voice to try and make it sound like it was different and arguing the other perspective, and it just sounded weird. Richard Hughes, I would love Dr. Clark and Drac to do a battle, a video on the Battle of Lepanto. We've got a couple of ideas for some battles to do together at the moment. Excellent, Daniel. <laughs> well, that sorted it out through live then. Um, send me a Discord link of time a message about when you're free and what times, and we'll sort it out. Creek could be fun. Right. In 1662, Charles II and Louis XIV in 1668 are pretty much humiliated. Here's the funny thing. And it... people try to tell us that well I had uh, I, as you saw in the introduction and I tried to make this point several times in the introduction really quite a lot of the things that are portrayed to be new aren't new the idea of a media information war is not new 
In fact, the Third Anglo-Dutch War is arguably won by an information campaign waged by William of Orange to put forward the idea that the Catholic, that Charles II, who is in alliance with a Catholic monarch, married to a Catholic wife uh, with a Catholic mistress and a ca suspected, strongly suspected Catholic brother is going to reintroduce Catholicism to, the, uh, to England and is going to bring back the worst of Mary. And actually, here's the thing. A lot of the history and the understanding of Mary, as in Bloody Mary, is not actually made in her own time period. It's made by William III and William... William of Orange, when he was doing this in his campaign, he was making out William uh, Mary to have been far worse, far more nasty than she actually was. So she was bad enough at her time that the English people weren't keen on Catholicism. But the constant media campaign made then is what pushed it. Jennifer, MacArthur thought it was God, very much a paper tiger when put onto a test at Daniel Freeman. Probably, but uh, MacArthur isn't being the only military leader who thought it was God. There's been Trump. And a few others. Um, Ernie King, I will, I have to say, Daniel Freeman, I do understand why you're not a fan, but I think Ernie King is slightly more complicated than MacArthur. And I have respect for Ernie King's decisions to an extent because he was trying to balance a lot. And the thing was, one of the interesting things, when we're talking about Tsing Tao, the war the British were fighting against Japan meant we wouldn't have been building all those escorts either. And Ernie King had to look at those two scenarios. He had to either build escorts to fight the Battle Atlantic or cruisers, destroyers and carriers and battleships to fight the Battle of the Pacific. And I would also add, I didn't miss the bit about BT. Uh, I was watching that and thought I was commenting on that. And actually, at the time, when we were discussing the idea that Rupert and BT were very similar, I have to say my thought was I finally remembered who BT, Rupert I mean, reminded me of the old day, BT. But the thing is, Rupert was actually a better politician than BT was. That's disturbing. Bilge Pumps is going to be fun, though. Uh, next week's one and last week's one. This week's one has caused me surprisingly less hassle than I thought it would be. I honestly thought this week's bilge pumps would cause a few issues. But it didn't. So, again, apologies for the on-time start, but late appearance. <laughs> Aaron King. Not incompetent, but pathological refusal to learn from um, hard learned lessons from the Battle of Atlantic. I don't see it as... <sighs> I don't think he was a refusal to learn from his mistake, from the lessons of the Battle Atlantic. I think King understood them completely. I just think he was prioritising the Battle of the Pacific. And he was prioritising that because you couldn't afford to ignore one theatre and he went, everyone else is focusing on... And honestly, he probably thought the Brits were doing enough to secure the Battle Atlantic. Admiral Albert Zaskby, now I know you're just trolling everyone. Um, Wofford Titan Tiberius. Warlord Titan Tiberius. In an, I'm an American and I can't stand MacArthur. He was guilty of neglect and almost first degree murder of the men on his command. New Guinea was hell on earth and MacArthur didn't get... New Guinea was... Uh, yeah, MacArthur was really not a good general. Really, really not. So, here's the thing. Let's start off with some background. We've got the Third Anglo-Dutch War. Which, by the way, for those who say, oh, Trump and his personal approach to the world is something new and uh, it, it, we don't understand it, it's not new. Uh, it's been around a long time. There have been lots of people like it in between. But uh, this is a classic example of a very personal approach. Charles II and Louis XIV. Louis XIV, of course, caused the fun of the Battle of Cape Passaro as well with some of his legacy, uh, the Treaty of Trek. 
Um, this time, Louis XIV wants to get... Well, he's upset because actually three great military powers managed to stop him in his first ambitions to take the Spanish Netherlands. The Dutch, the British, because it is the British, and the Swedish Empire. Yep. This is a time when the Swedish Empire are a major military power. They're pretty cool as well. Excellent. Did William O'Connell's uh, William of Orange's propaganda campaign have success? Did Charles II feel pressure from it? Yes. Yes. Colossal pressure. And arguably, that combined with his losses is what caused him to conclude the Treaty of Westminster. It's also what built the connections of William between the le uh, between him and the ruling classes in England and to an extent Scotland which would later see um, him take power when James II proved as bad a politician as his brother had worried he was. Right, so the Swedes were a fairly decent military power at this point and very professional. The Dutch had problems in this war and they start off by losing to the French on land and they do really lose on land, but they manage to get various things. Um, they're losing so badly on land that Johann de Witt wants to declare peace but he gets over uh, over um, overthrown by William Orange. De Reuter and Brackett managed to buy enough time at sea by keep winning their battles that the Allies can't break through. And then the Dutch flood the Netherlands. They literally do. They flood the Netherlands to stop the advance of the French um forces and then they do that classic british maneuver so for those again who think it's classically british and it's british in the way of war no the british learn this way of war by watching the dutch do it dutch go we are small and can't afford to maintain can't afford people wise to maintain a large army and a large navy and secure our territories and also go attacking the french and we need to go offensive to win this Okay, let's hire some Germans. And that's what they do. They hire German armies to go and beat up the French. And the Germans go, Yeah! And enjoy themselves beating up the French. And several thousand, uh, uh, about several hundred years of history begins. Well, it continues, let's be honest. The Germanic tribes have been beating up the Gauls for, well, the the Gauls end up inviting in the Romans, basically to protect them against from the Germanic tribes. So, yeah, the Germanic tribes have been beating, beating up the French for a long time. That was like Dodds Clock. Could you recommend some introductory reading on the Anglo-Dutch Wars? Um. Barry Hilton has been doing some amazing war games in the period. I would like to know more of the context. <sighs> mm -hmm. um, from the naval perspective, it's good old Command of the Ocean by Nicholas Rogers is probably your best bet. Um, that will pretty much cover most of it. Uh, Antonia Fraser's Charles II is actually is my preferable one. And I get a bit of stick for sometimes recommending her, but I like her work because she's good at getting giving you the narrative of the people. You know, in the nicest way, she lets you make up your own mind and produces a very good topic. And there's also... Ah... <sighs> <sighs>
The Stuart Age by Barry Coward. Um, 1603 to 1714. This is the third edition. And it's an interesting book, which basically is broken up into different parts that cover the different aspects of what was going on. <sighs> and it's a good, good work. So that's the, that pretty much if you have these two you won't go far wrong Ugh. add in this one Antonia Fraser's um King Charles II. That's also good. Wars of the Three Kingdoms, Civil Wars by Trevor Royal. Pretty darn good. And Cromwell by Antonio Fraser as well. You will have a fairly good understanding of what was going on. From the British perspective. From Louis XIV's perspective, that's a whole different ball game and a lot more books. And the Guden Lou is, of course, Trump's flagship. And he got this painted himself. Seriously, Trump just seems to exist to get paintings made of himself. I do not... The, the guy has such an ego. Anyway. How did the Royal Navy... Jeff Wheeler, how did the Royal Navy change from Textile to Passara? Arrow. Um, it professionalized a lot. It professionalized incredibly. Uh, between 1673 and the Battle of Tabasaro, which was... Just remind myself. Okay, so you have what is theoretically... The passage of 45 years. In 45 years, you go from a navy which is mostly being commanded by, I would call them gentlemen sailors, gentlemen commanders, to a navy which is professionalized. And it's a very different navy. It is an incredibly different navy in terms of its content, in terms of its promotions, its actions. The officers you would be getting, in the nicest way, there would be no room for an Admiral Sprague in the Royal Navy of 1718. In fact, in the Royal Navy of 1718, if you had had an admiral go to the king and go, I will personally hunt down or capture this enemy admiral in any battle, and that will be my purpose for being there, they would have been fired. They would have been quickly got rid of. They would have been no more. Can, you, you cannot imagine Earl St. Vincent or Rodney saying, I am going to take down this admiral. You cannot imagine Nelson doing that. That's not what they're there for. That's not their job. It's not personal. It's professional. Their job is to take out the enemy by capture, burning, or killing. Their no job is not individuals. It's not, I want to kill that admiral. It's, I want to take out that fleet. It's a whole different ball game. And this is half the trouble when you're looking at this, because honestly, not even the Dutch have this at this point. Thomas Rutler, is there a decent plan online of the Battle of Texas on 1673? Not that I found. I found several plans, none that I liked. 
Warlord Titan Tiberius. I want some of those leather boots they had back in the late 1600s. Those things were fabulous. Mm, pretty cool, yeah. Dan Freeman. Ah, uh, benefit of the well found lunch. E.g. for both supporting artists, but also their materials at the time. Hmm. Jeff Yellow, who professionalized the Royal Navy? Actually, it's this interesting thing. Um, who professionalized the Royal Navy? Well, to an extent, Peep starts the process. Peeps and Monk managed to get the Navy professionalizing. James II, in his role as Lord High Admiral, continues it. So it's going on at this point. But it's after William comes over, uh, and sort of Parliament takes far more control of the Royal Navy under, under sort of under the uh, auspices of the system set up there in the Glorious Revolution. And you start to get very much a, a development then in the senior officers. And the trouble is, at that point, you've had a few generations of officers going through the Admiralty, which have been set up by Peeps and all these things, which are sort of starting to professionalize. So you're getting one interesting thing is you are getting a lot more professional captains even appearing at this point. And one of the problems for Sprague and for Rupert, etc., is that their captains are looking at them going, What? 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 Please repeat. What? If I say what a little bit louder, perhaps you'll change your mind. What? Are you quite sure? Everything up to... Sir, have you bothered to read the chart recently? Mm -hmm. In luckily they got rid of the corsets. That we're all lucky that they got rid of the corsets. Do you know what was the funniest thing? Is when you actually study, start to study the history, you realise that traditionally corsets have been worn as much by men as by women, especially by men of a certain role in life who want to maintain the image that they maintain a certain physique. It's quite funny once you start to realize it that it's a mutually torturous society and frankly both sides were equally stupid to be wearing them <clears throat> by Sam Ronson, don't sure but he served the uh, RM British services only Rupert went uh, from Palpatine to English to French to privateer to English again and basically he was a royalist and if you were a royal family he'd serve you So, okay, difficult to visualize what's happening in battle. So, how to put it. In this battle, you have the French van goes off chasing Van Brecht. Uh, Va off, uh, after Brecht. And he manages to come around behind them and block them off. The center under Sprague decides it's going to spend its entire time fighting Trump. Because rather than send out singles, signals to his squadron or organize them or lead them, or in any way actually fulfill his command duty, what he's going to do is sell his ships, and he keeps taking, he keeps getting ships on, I mean, ships around the battle trying to get to Trump. So wherever Trump is, that is where Sprag is going. And then you've got Rupert at the back going, do this, do that, no one's taking any notice of me. I will charge in! Oh, for God's sake. Why? Ugh. And here's the thing. This is a classic example of how you throw away a battle. Albert what did Trump do to Sprague? Insulted the mother? Actually, worse than that. Trump suggested that it would be better if he left his wife to command the fleet. Uh, Sprague's wife was the daughter of a notorious privateer. In fact, the person who'd been in charge of Dunkirk uh, when it had been a real massive privateer base. And um, he was, uh, she was also herself a bit of a noted sailor. So he suggested that, frankly, it would have been better for the English if Sprague had left his, his wife in charge rather than himself. Um, after he embarrassed Sprague on more than one occasion. Mm. 
Jeff Beeler, Sprague does criticize Rupert on quite a lot of occasions. And the reason Sprague criticizes Rupert is because Sprague feels he should be in charge, not Rupert. Honestly, I don't think Sprague should have been in charge because if you're... Uh, the thing is, as the second in command, going around chasing the enemy, an enemy admiral like an imbecile is one thing. Imagine if he'd been the commander of the force running around doing it. That would have just been embarrassing. The trouble is, this period, they're acting like the ships are not, are not, not so much a military unit. And we often talk about them being cavalry commanders and them acting like cavalry, but it's not like cavalry. It's like feudal knights on a battlefield go racing around going, oh, I recognize that sigil. Attack! That is my neighbor who I hate! He's on the other side. You know, it, it's feudal banners. It's, it's, it's not having a proper battle. It's not, it's not a command structure. It's a case of, I am an admiral! Yes, and are you going to act like one? No, I'm going to act like a twit and go charging in. Really? You are an admiral. You are supposed to be an adult. Behave like one. We'll be getting on to the Dutch in a second. I'll be politer about them. Is Iron Brewer sparkling water? No. It's a, it's a form. I, I suppose if you're American, you'd call it a soda. But um, UK, we just call it a fizzy drink. I sometimes drink normal milk as well from my Winnie the Pooh mug. Actually, the, the, the thing at the moment, here's the current joke. Right, so I have four mugs like this, which I occasionally drink milk from. Usually when it's in the morning for uh, bilge pumps. You all know who Winnie the Pooh is. But can you guess which world leaders are Tigger, Eeyore, and Piglet? That causes fun. Currently, there's a running ge running guess a scenario going on with the Belgium Pumps crew to work out who they are. Angus Sonner, did the British sailors wear uniforms? For the time? No, they did have slops given to them, which were uh, articles of clothing they were supposed to be assigned and were budgeted for, but they were often organized on a ship-by-ship -ship basis. And the captains themselves would see to them. And it... Well, this is another thing which redeems Rupert for me in my view of him versus Sprague. Sprague penny pinched and didn't like to do anything. Rupert basically took the budget that was for uniforms for his sailors and would pay for sailors and when he had it would actually double it. And for captains who he considered of good standing and great sailors, but who are not of the richest sort, he would uh, order I have found myself in possession of far too much clothing, my dear so-and-so. Please take this, uh, please, would you do me a favor and take this provision of clothing for your men? So this is the thing. Rupert, I will agree that he is not the best commander in the world in terms of a strategic commander or uh, in terms of an actual le uh, military leader. But in terms of being... An all right guy in that he cares for those people who's under command. He makes sure they get fed. He makes sure they're armed. He makes sure they're clothed. He is very good at that. And so I think that's possibly why out of the two admirals there, the British sailors by far in advance, in a, far and away preferred Rupert to Sprague. And you find it interesting because Sprague will, uh, writes all these things slagging off Rupert and a whole load of uh, naval captains and officers and even some sailors who could write, which wasn't unusual. Sailors being educated and being able to write is not as unusual as it sometimes made out to be. Write pamphlets and articles saying, no, Rupert was great. You were being an idiot. And Sprague, of course, dies in this battle, so he doesn't get to do it again.
Then, for you, my knowledge of the history of clothing is not so strong. I have got a friend who did a PhD in naval uniforms. I should get her on this channel at some point to chat about it. I think it's something to Sprague. Honey, you want to handle this battle? Actually, it probably would have been quite good, because there are all sorts of rumours about Sprague's wife, including that she possibly did actually have a few ship captures to her name. But, you know, we can't prove it, and it's lost in times of history. But she certainly wasn't a um, demure lady. Easy to be told what to do or anything like that. Rarifel, what was the typical engage range in, in, in this intensified uh, time, initial time? And were well, boarding actions common? Boarding actions were quite commonly attempted. Not always successful. And the range was a lot closer. Okay. The range... And there is a reason why Rupert is a surprise to everyone with his aggressiveness, because he charges his fleet in as close as he can get to the enemy. Because they're not sure how far they can hit. They've got a mixture of cannon. Um, quite a lot of them are brass cannon, which have many interesting advantages, but also some disadvantages, in that they tend to have quite a few more quirks than iron cannon. As such... They charge in very, very close, and those pictures I've been showing this one. You can see the ships are really pictured very, very close to each other. They are very close to each other. 200 to 300 yards would be considered a long-range engagement. 100 to 200 yards in a battle scenario like this would be quite common. 50 to 100 yards would not be un un unheard of. And less than 50 yards, you are trying for a boarding action, and that wasn't uncommon either. Danny Freeman, I have not watched the proper intro yet, but who would you have put in charge of the Anglo-French fleet? Honestly, if I had to pick the best commander that... Charles II had access to at this point was probably James, his brother. But he didn't want to risk him in case he got killed, because he was known for his bravery. But again, that might have saved a lot of trouble for Charles and for the England, uh, for Britain, for James to have died a hero in a battle. Hi, Frederick Vega. Richie Hughes, Tigger Mussolini. Hmm? <laughs> they are all current leaders. As we know, Winnie the Pooh is one of the current leaders. The others are all, are all current leaders. They are four. Uh, what sort of signal apparatus do they have? Flags. Flags, rockets occasionally, and lamps. So it's pretty much the same as you have later. They don't have a flag book as per se set up, but usually... Admirals would prearrange what sort of flags meant what when they raised them. And they would raise up flags, and then they were supposed to be repeated by frigates and various other things and other ships. But again, it's if they actually were able to communicate with each other. Because Sprague forgets to communicate with his force because he's so intent on trying to kill Trump. It's my personal battle. And then you've got Comte d'Estes, who's actually... The French Admiral is in, this is going to sound so strange coming from me. The French Admiral is actually the most professional Admiral, arguably, on the Allied side. Um, he couldn't be put in command because he really isn't as qualified to be in command um, socially as Rupert, unfortunately. And frankly, you know, that would get him into trouble. But he's the son of a Marshal of France. He's uh, had a few naval expeditions to himself. He's commanded in the land war. And he's operating under rules of engagement provided by Louis XIV. And this is another problem you have in the command structure. That Louis XIV has ordered them not to risk their ships. To engage the enemy, but not to risk the ships. I do not want to lose any ships in this operation. You can't really win a war without losing risking ships. But, you know, that's what they're trying for. Mm-hmm.
Warlord the Cyber Terrorist. I love sharing the Winnie Pit Pooh meme with a certain leader's face on <laughs> Oh. Well, a formalized system uh, don't remember, well, a formalized system of signals wasn't introduced until the late eighteenth century or over a hundred years later. Um it was basically every admiral would have. But honest uh, but also James as Lord High Admiral Fleet had actually introduced some standardized signals and was known for his own naval actions, had a very rigorous command system of this flags means this, and it will be repeated by these frigates. Da 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 da. <sighs> Angus Sonner, some commanders were meant for logistics, other for battles. This is the thing. Actually, Rupert, it's going to sound strange, is a good administrator, and he's good at caring for people. You know, he sets up the Hudson Bay Company. He does all sorts of things very well. This is one reason that he's so rich, because he's good at business opportunities, and he's good investing in things and people. And he does invest in things and people quite happily. He never marries, but he does have kids with several different mistresses. Um, but he is good at investing in things and people. In many ways, he would have been. It would be better if, on a purely military level, if because he was also about a politician. If he could, if Charles swapped Rupert and James around, had Rupert as the Lord High Admiral, and Char and, and James as the uh, fleet commander. That would have been better um, out of the options available to him. <clears throat> Mary Freeman, that's about Navy uniforms are interesting. All the considerations for clothing, then you get into, uh, into flash proofing. Yeah. We'll not go in for that one quickly. Uh, Fair me. Good that uh, the Swiss didn't join in, mainly because they were stuck on Lake Geneva. No joke. Yeah, that that was good, quite useful. The Swiss getting involved would have been even more fun. <laughs> I had read the RN keeps using the same ship names because the names are already in the code book. <laughs> no, we never do that. not quite that bad. It's more certain names are quite useful. But still, I'm still going to be starting that campaign for the Dutch. They need to have a bracket. <sighs> their purpose side. Was caliber or bore size standardized at this point across the Navy, or would each ship's captain be responsible for their shot? Pretty, if theoretically you have the beginnings of the former, but reality it is mostly the latter. Uh, Jeff Beeler, James does command earlier at Sol Bay, yes, and he does a fairly decent job at Sol Bay. Um, it, Sol Bay is certainly far more successful than this one, uh, than this one is. But after that, uh, Charles gets worried about him going to die because he almost gets killed a couple of points. So Charles forbids him from going to sea. Gone Eagle. Charles II did have a number of uh, uh, various children. Uh, bastard children, as it's technically firmed. Aren't any of them useful? None of them are really old enough at this point, and the couple who do decide to get involved in operations don't tend to end up that successfully. Monmouth was a bit of an interesting gentleman. Boris Johnson of Tigger. No. Boris Johnson is... Hmm. No, I'm not going to say who, uh, which is which. And uh, Richard Hughes, Dr. Clark, who is the best naval commander in the world in the 1600s? It's probably between, well, uh, when we, how looking at the Dutch ones, it's probably between two of them, I would argue. Abelsaski, what's the difference between ship of the line and man of war? Where man of war closer to galleons? Basically, man of war are the transition period between galleons to um, ship of the line. And that's what I tend to use them to describe that phrase to describe the sort of transition period as the ships are changing and evolving. 
The trouble is with a galleon, it's basically you've got the galleons, then you've got the fast galleons of the English, which become everyone's sort of standard size. And as they sort of continue evolving, they become man of war. And then after a while, they evolve into ships of the line. And you can tell slowly they get shorter and squatter proportionally. Although, actually, they're still quite big and tough and massive. Oh, I would say two of the best admirals in the 1600s at this time are on this um, screen. Now, I think I would say three of the top five. Um, I would go De Reuter, definitely. Arguably number one. Uh, Bracket, arguably number two. And Trump. Arguably number five. But Trump gets a lot more press than Bracket and Bankert. <laughs> RF4. Eeyore is Boris and Tigger Trump. RF4. I'll stay on topic now. Are you sure? Although one of those is definitely right. I'm not going to comment as to whether the other one is. <laughs> Jeffila, Rupert cannot outrank James, though. Well, the thing is, you could make Rupert Lord of the Admiralty in charge of administration, and you could send James to sea as Lord High Admiral, Supreme Commander at sea. You can, you can get round these things quite easily in the British system. Or you could make Rupert the Lord Steward. Which basically means in British constitutional terms, Lord Steward is an interesting title. But it's the senior pre councillor to the monarch. And is considered almost equivalent to the Prince of Wales in terms of their status. I.e. second line. Of, it become, it's a sort of interesting issue. In Happy, how would you evaluate the Dutch versus English ship at the time? Were the Dutch still in their prime? Were the English already? The Dutch were definitely in their prime. The English were getting to their prime. The English were still getting there. Mm -hmm. Dr. Clark, biggest le lesson modern navies could learn from this period. Uh, well, the biggest lesson is have a clear communications and command strategy and have admirals who actually know how to fight the sea, i.e. De Reuter, Blanket, Trump. In Happy, didn't the later standardized British ships line uh, start their lineage during the Commonwealth Navy? Ah, uh, to an extent they do start there, but as I said, the man of war I use as a tradition as a transition title. I these are not yet ships of the line as we would understand ships of the line would become. That's very much by the time you get to Cape Passaro, then you've got ships of the line appearing as we would understand them. You've got a ratage system, you've got all those things in place. But they're not galleons either, or even super fast galleons or rasse galleons. So this is why I use the phrase man of war to describe them. That does make me a bit of an outlier amongst naval historians. I'm not sure if many others do it the same as, the way as I do, but the great thing is I can justify it. If they disagree, that's fine. They're not writing the book. Well, I'm not writing the book yet either, but I might do. Um, who was Rupert's father? Oh, that's an interesting question. I often forget who Rupert's father was. Um... <laughs> RFO, what was the origin of the regionally focused admiralty and how did it work operationally? Okay, so basically the regionally focused admiralty of the Dutch was a reality of the nature of the Republic and the way it was organized. It, it's kind of like if you have America states rights sort of people, uh, uh, let's say 
the Confederacy had tried to really organize a navy. And instead of order, or, organizing the Confederate Navy, what they've done is every state organized its own navy and then they combined together for operations. And each one agreed to supply certain things. It gets complicated. There's lots of people with recriminations that you aren't supplying your bit. You're not doing yours. You're not doing yours. Da, 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 da. But it works quite well because also they're in competition with each other. But the trouble is those shame ships that are used for war are also used for trade and peace. Which has an effect on their design, on their construction. So the British ships are built for war. The Dutch ships are built for trading and war. And over time, the British ships start to overtake the Dutch. Massively. Um, Bankert did get a... Um, he got a frigate which went out of service... There's a frigate which is currently in service with the Greeks, but which was um, in service with the, let's see, h bank Bankart. Yeah, there was a Cortina-class frigate, which was named for him as well. Um, he had an Admiral-class destroyer. Uh, then he got a Q-class destroyer. Well, that was a Royal Navy Q-class, which was uh, HMS Quilliam, uh, acquired in 1945 and scrapped in 1957. And then a Cortina-class frigate. So he had a run of um, a couple of destroyers and a frigate. It's, you know, he he, he deserves more. Right then, so, he's a good admiral, and they're all interesting admirals. Uh, the Reuter is possibly, the interesting thing about the system is it works well with the Reuter because he is such a senior figure. He is so, he's won so many victories, he's got such status in the Netherlands at this time that he can wield the admiralties together. He has that power. When he's backed by William of Orange, he has so much power, he can do whatever is necessary. Trump. Trump is just obsessed with Sprague, as Sprague is with Trump. It just, De Reuter manages to use... Basically, De Reuter ignores Trump for the whole of this battle. So basically, De Reuter goes, Banquet, you do this. It's uh, some of these other junior admirals. They have lots of admirals, the um, Dutch, in this battle. But these are the three senior commanders. You do this, you do this. And he's ignoring Trump. He's ignoring Trump the whole time. And after Trump goes, I, we won a glorious battle. And everyone's going, you basically spent the entire time wasting ships fighting one enemy admiral. Jebula, Royal Sovereign messes things up by being big enough to be ship of the line. There are lots of ships there which are big enough to be ships of the line. Um, you have the Royal Therese, 80 guns. The Pompunu, 70 guns. And that's, just, that's in the French. Uh, you have lots of English ships which, again, are in the level at which they could be ships of the line. That's I'm not saying they're not, they are, trans, as I said, this is a period of transition. Some of those ships look jolly similar to what we'd expect a ship line to be. They're not similar once you get below the water line and you start to look at some of their proportions and their framing and their structuring, because those are still evolving. But they're, so they are not, they're not galleons, but they're not yet ships of the line. So that's why I'm calling them man of war, to just make it easy to differentiate. So I go, basically go, 
All right, this is a period when we call them galleons. Then they become race galleons, race galleons, and then they become they continue evolving, but they're not yet reached the ship of the line thing. So we can either we can try and call them ships of the line, and rated oh, that's not really the right thing though. But so we call them man of war. Ships of the line is the other phrase used, them, but for ships of the line usually is associated with the rating system. So that's why again I go man of war. Jeff Beeler, Rupert could have been king, but died too early and managed not to have an heir. Actually, the thing is, Rupert did have an heir. Rupertera, a daughter he had by a mistress, but he acknowledged that. He didn't marry any of his mistresses. <sighs> but yes, he could have been, it might well have been his children who'd taken over, or him who'd taken over, rather than William of Orange, because, again... He was much preferred than J James was. Jack jumped late, but were trading companies also additional actors on um, together with provinces of uh, uh, admiralties? Yes, but often the trading companies and the admiralties were linked, and often those ships would be passed between the two. Bankert was a Dutch East Indian Company admiral before he was a Dutch Navy admiral. Yes. And he was a good one. Quite a lot of their officers were. Jeff Bieler, Rupert's dad was Elector Palatine. His mum was Stuart. Oh, was a Stuart. Yes. Again, it was a quite a powerful family he came from. Hmm. <laughs> Hmm. So, if we consider the Dutch Navy ships, and these ones, are, well, you have far more guns for, but they are slightly lighter. You have the Spiegel, which has 70. The Oliphant, 82. The Hollandia, 80. And the Gooden Lou, 82. The Seven Provincial, 80. The Vigiled, 80. Uh, commanded by another Admiral. Vice Admirals seem to get killed in battle because you've got Isaac Swears killed in the battle. Vice Admiral um, Efsun de Lift, killed in battle. Uh, Indirect, 72. Inhum, 70. Pacificetti, 76. West Friesland, 78. Anheim, 70. Wappen van Utsun, 72. Wappen, 70. Prince Hendrik Kasmir, 70. Groningen, 70. So you have 70, 80 gunships, 90 gunships going around. They're part of the fleets. The rest of the fleets are mostly made up of 60, 50 gunships. So they are definitely 4th rates, 5th rates, 
they're in terms of their numbers. They're just not fourth or fifth rate in terms of their construction. I'm going to jump the stuff which is comparing Prince Rupert to the son of a Sith Lord because, as we all know, the Sith were actually very good at fighting and very good at organization and planning. And Rupert is quite good at some of those things. Then if Oh, did it, did it, did it. Right. G. Peter, it's only after this that Charles marries Mary off to William to set up a Protestant Stuart heir to the throne. After his plan to make England secure falls away. If Mary has kids, things okay. Um, Let's see. I'm just going to check that because I have a feeling. Yeah. Um Well, she was 17 in 1689. And she marries William the 3rd. Now, the thing is this battle happens in 1673. So when she was 11 I think. Yeah. So she was 11 when this battle took place. So I... Um, and she's married to William... Um... Sixteen years later, so I'm not sure if we can put down her marriage to William down to this loss of this third Anglo uh, Anglo Dutch war. Honestly, I'm going to say it this way: Charles realizes he can't control William uh, quite a bit early on because he does try to control William. He tries to get his nephew after he, he thinks Charles thinks when his nephew sees his power, that's good. He's going to win the war. That was done. Unfortunately, William. Decide he's going to continue fighting the war and actually beat everyone. Just terrible. Danny Freeman, I now have a vision of Prince Rupert as a Sith Lord, but seeming like he's crossed with either Captain Flashheart or George, Black Order Ghost Force, mixed in together with Moody Anakin Darth Maul. Why did you have to share that with the audience, Daniel? That's going to give me nightmares now for the rest of the week. Uh, Daniel Freeman, uh, Dutch Clark, is it good for morale to kill the occasional vice admiral? Um, it seems to be in the Dutch Navy. They seem to die quite regularly. Jeff Mueller, who of Rupert's captains goes on to bigger and better things? Not many of them. Um, there's a few who do quite well. I've got a bit of a list here. But again, we don't have that many details on them. Uh, this is one of the interesting things. And honestly... It's like... We have an HMS Unicorn here. We don't know who her captain was at this time, according to the list which I managed to compile. I might find it later. It's one of the interesting things, because I did so much sort of work on Singtao. I sort of did a little bit of initial research on this. Then was dealing with all the Singtao stuff, and then I spent Tuesday, Wednesday prepping for this. So there could be stuff I've missed, but the captains seem to... This is the first generation, in many ways, of the captains who've gone through during the Peeps reforms. It's the next generation, the generation after you have to watch. So what's interesting enough is I can tell you who some of the lieutenants were and first lieutenants were on the ships and some of the masters. And they get promoted quite quickly. Uh. 
Richard Hughes. Charles II was a good king, realistic and pragmatic, not perfect. I would argue he definitely has aspects of both. Am I correct in thinking that naval artillery was, on average, lighter weight in terms of weight of shot than 100 years later? Yes. It was lighter than it was 45 years later. Anything betrothed, not married. Um, to an extent, yes, but not in a binding betrothal which would cause issues. And happy. Did the policies at Kelber already have an influence on the French time, or was he too short in his position at the time of the battle? too short in his position at the time of battle. It was starting to have an impact, but not yet having an, as massive one. Thomas Ryan. Mary married in 1677 when she was 15. Oh, yeah. it's She's coronated. Yeah, but still, that's a few years later. Thanks, Thomas, for that one. Um... I really should pay more attention to the marriages of the marriages of some of those people. I often find it more interesting to research the personalities, though. Um, thank you. I suppose the thing is that these very young marriages were more contracts of marriage and would not be consummated. Um, I think marriage of fifteen probably consummated. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes. Greek beer for the Battle of Crete. Actually, shouldn't we have a smashing plates time? Also, it's one of the interesting things is that I can find out far more about the Dutch fleet at this time than I can the English and the French. In fact, my list of the Dutch fleet, which I have to admit, I started off by you looking at Wikipedia lists of the ships, because that's usually a fairly good starting point. Then I got some books, then I looked at articles, and I built up my lists from those point positions. And the interesting thing, the Dutch one, I can find a complete list of the various commanders, right down to the commanders of the advice yachts and the fire ships. For example, the fire ship, one of the fire ships on the Dutch fleet, the uh, Rappen van Velsen, which has four guns, was commanded by the Jan van Kampen. Or Zalm was commanded by Cornelius Zelmstuk Kok. And Kasten van Loon was commanded by Pieter Hendrikson Poop. I do love these names. But honestly, here's my writing up. So, early on in the battle, De Reuter gains a weather gauge advantage, and this allows him to dictate what's going on and forces, uses a banquet to separate the Allied, the Destri's van from the main fleet. Um, and the French ships at this point were now out of the battle. After that, they don't play any part in the battle anymore. So that means the advantage the Allies have over the Dutch is immediately erased. The Dutch are now the stronger fleet. So in many ways, now it's on the Dutch to win. Uh, the battle then becomes a grueling melee. Sprague and Trump basically are commanding the sort of the rear divisions of the fleet. And Sprague has, as I've mentioned, publicly sworn an oath to Charles II that he would kill or capture Trump, who has insulted him so mortalously. Right then. And here's the thing. 
There are about a dozen ships on both sides which are damaged enough they have to be towed away from the fight. For both Sprague and Tromp, they account for three of these each. Fighting each other. They basically uh, blast each other until they've smashed the ship to pieces. Then they race off in boats to get another ship to come back and fight each other and blast each other to pieces again. It's just... Why? You're wasting ships. So they're just out of it and you can ignore them. Anyway, because of the dueling going on, the English centre, which is commanded by Rupert, gets separated from the rear. And then suddenly Backett manages to disengage from the French and joins the Dutch centre. Then Rupert decides to withdraw from the set fight in the centre to north to get reconnect with his rear squadron so he won't get overwhelmed by the Dutch. He's actually doing quite well here. He's commanding, he's organising his fleet, he's managing to get it on. It's basically Rupert. The trouble is, the moment he... He's quite good at communicating with his own squadron. The communications break down once he's trying to communicate with other admirals because he presumes they'll understand what he's thinking and see his solutions. Or alternatively, he presumes they'll just actually do their job. And as we all know, you should never make assumptions about yours uh, about people you're working with. Unfortunately, they are followed by De Reuter, who's been joined by Janssen Van Ness and Bankert. And the French are now still far, far away. And the Dutch try and capture what remains of the Prince, which is Sprague's now isolated flagship. But they fail. Rupert rescues it. Sprague is by this point dead, we think. And um, I'm sure at no point was Rupert going, Hallelujah! on this one. And then basically both fleets have run out of ammunition and men, and they decide to withdraw. Uh, it's just, it's a battle which frankly was absurd from the beginning to end. Really was absurd from beginning to end. And has, well, as you can see, consequences. They do launch fire ships at each other. They do try and do all that, but it doesn't really work that well. Mm -hmm. Thomas Roy, William and Tearful Mary were buried, uh, were married at St. James's Palace on 4th of November of 1677. The bedding ceremony to publicly establish the consummation of marriage was attended by the royal family. That always disturbs me, that part of the thing. Doing uh, having, uh, having relations for your first time with an audience, that just sounds wrong in so many, many ways. But that could be me being prudish. <laughs> Jack, maybe Captain's List was such precise due to the systems of the Dutch fleet organization. Yeah, that was one of the reasons why it was it is so easy to get, is because the Dutch fleet was very organized. And as Jane has pointed out, the Dutch Navy was far more organized than most other European navies at the time. They do have good lists. And to the British developing their organization, Dutch are there when it comes to organization. The trouble is there's a limit to what the Dutch can do. Because the British can always focus, afford to focus much more on the Navy than the Dutch can, who have huge land borders they have to defend in Europe. Thank you, Freeman. The Amity archives are not all that well analyzed and made accessible in national archives, unless it is relevant for research of genealogy. They are interesting. Um, my friend, um, my friend and colleague from Global Maritime History, is doing a huge amount of work on this. Uh, he's doing so so much, and it's really Sam McLean. He's doing a huge amount of work, and it's really interesting to see what he gets up to. 
So uh, if you want to look at that, that's always good. So in Wilson, however, the marriage of William and Mary again, they were a devoted couple and William never recovered from Mary's death. No, he did seem to be, they were, it seemed to be a, a very good relationship. They made efforts to work at it, which some relationships don't at this time. Uh, and as Daniel Freeman says, up to a goal, in reply to Golden Eagle, speaking of Polish, why was Operation Peking so named? The There is a randomly assigned naming system which can end up with some very, very weird names. Uh, for goodness sake, the British have had Operation Corporate. And I think they have... It might be an urban legend, but I remember hearing a story about there being actually an operation called Operation Dixie Chick from 2002, 2003. Not sure if it's true. It could well be an urban legend. But again, it wouldn't surprise me. Jennifer, as to admirals in the 17th century, Blake and Jerv James Stewart are probably the only two British ones you would trust to do a competent job. And you've just managed to mention the other two in my top five admirals from the 6th or 17th century. <laughs> I ha it goes Trump, Blanket, Blake, Stewart, Roy, and no, it goes Reuter, Blanket, Blake, Stewart, Trump. That's about it. Dev Squad, I'm late. Who won the duel between Trump and Sprague? Seeing as Sprague managed to get sunk um, when his little boat taking him to another ship got overturned, I'm going to say Trump won it on ruling. Honestly, might have been Sprague's wife, though, because apparently she sends Trump some bad alcohol afterwards, which makes him very, very sick. But again, could be an urban, mission, um, urban myth. It was one of those things written up in history, which is myth or fiction, and they never really said whether it was myth or fiction. Don Schroeder, communications would have been very difficult with all the smoke and fire in battle. I suspect the commanders wouldn't have had much idea what was going on beyond their immediate vicinity. No, they really didn't. And that was where the point of frigates are so important, because the frigates are supposed to hang back, even in this period, and communicate in to admirals who can not maybe see 10 feet that direction, but can usually see outside the battle back a bit better to see what the ships are up to. And so they look out for their frigates, which were used to repeat signals. Uh, Abbasaski, considering the strategic value of the battle for the Dutch, if I was a captain of a Dutch robot during this, I'd make sure that my name was mentioned in some chronicles or annotation I took about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you, Daniel Freeman. The chat regarding National Archives of Part to try and get a Dutch Clark access to stuff or similar. I spent half my life trying to get access to that stuff there. Um... Uh, no, the family did not stand around the bed. The couple were left alone. The sheets were inspected later. You see, this is the trouble. Um, it, it's all sort of, it's very ritualized, the thing. And the there is some debate as to, in these ceremonies, whether the couples closed the curtains on the um, beds and the family did stay outside or what happened, etc., I'm hoping that Stephanie is right in her reports and that the more salacious reports I have read about it were wrong. But, um, yeah. There's lots of weird stuff. I sometimes think it's people imagining back. Calvin Gansman, the Dutch have a huge land war, and they were locked in a land war against the sea itself, even by then. Yep. Hey, 
I don't know. I'm seeing some knockdown knockdown effects that led directly to Trafalgar and Nelson. There are lots of knockdown effects that lead on. And one of the interesting things about this battle is the French go back to Louis XIV and go, we have studied well under De Reuter. We have learned lots about the future of naval war. And that apparently feeds into some of Colbert's plans for reforms. So maybe De Reuter was a good teacher, maybe he wasn't. I'm asking you to go on Eagle. I'll dig it out. I think I've read the reasoning for the naming somewhere in my Polish Navy books. Hmm, interesting. Um, if that's, I'm presuming that's about Operation Peking rather than Operation Dixie Chicks. But she's, Dr. Clark, what were the greatest lessons learned from the Battle of Texiel? Well, the most important lesson learned by far and away was you need to professionalize your fleet. You don't want to fight the Dutch unless you have to. The French aren't to be trusted in naval war as your allies. And um, the really big, big lesson is you need to uh, you need to have a communications. It's about this time that you know they start doing even more work on getting the communications, on getting the flag signals were going. So yes, we talk about by the end of the 18th century that. The flag signals are really, really good. We talk at the Battle of Cape Passaro how there are communications going forward, but they're limited. But they're quite clearly understood by the officers. Well, basically, the Battle of Texiel is where this almost begins, because it's going, okay, what went wrong here? What went wrong? And it's also interesting to note, there's almost, it's over 100 years before they do their next battle against the Dutch after Texio. And that's Camperdown. Where Duncan whips them. Yep. So basically, um, also find a tall Scottish gentleman to command your fleet when facing off against the Dutch. Tall, smiling, but very imposing Scottish gentleman to fight your Dutch. Daniel Freeman's one. Don't put cavalry officers in charge of navies. Well, I wish to say that had stopped them, but it didn't. Two. Don't allow your senior officers to get a go off on random side quests or vendettas. Yeah, we can all hope that one was remembered. Three. Be wary of working with the French. Yeah, agreeing with me. Thomas Royalist. In 1673, the Duke of York's instructions for battle or ordering uh, for be the better ordering His Majesty's fleet in staying uh, in sailing were issued with some signals before or after Tech Seal. There is a draft which goes out to the fleet before Tech Seal. There is a finalized version which comes out after Tech Seal. So most of the senior, all of the senior commanders have seen it before Tech Seal. And most of the captains have seen it before Tech Seal. Afterwards, they've all got it. Jeff Hiller, what were the war goals, if any, did uh, Charles attain? He did get New York Colony back. Um, well, he was supposed to be destroying the, Repub uh, the Dutch Republic, and he failed with that one. He was supposed to be stopping the French from seizing too much control in the Netherlands, and it was the Dutch who stopped that. And he was supposed to be securing financial independence, so he, is, he wasn't dependent upon Parliament, and he failed at that. So I'd say none of them. Everyone, five. Texiel is a nice, easy word to spell among all the long Dutch place names. So have plenty of battles there. We could hope. <laughs> Jeff, or, so here we see the seeds of the attack on the French fleet of Melza Kibir. Yes. To be honest, here you start to see a lot of what the Royal Navy becomes. You've got the fact is you can start to see why eventually you get you, you have both the chase, the general chase and the attack, so the aggressiveness, 
And that's really been started by Prince Rupert because Prince Rupert is the one who goes, starts off this idea of aggressive attacking the enemy, of aggressively dominating the enemy. He really does inoculate the officers under his command. He goes, look, we haven't been around long enough. We've had all the issues of the revolution and all these things and the reformation. We need to aggressively dominate the enemy. And he does that well. So that's good. But also you have the weird breaking up of the line for Sprague to do what he wants to do in this. And finally, the other thing, you, you have the British really start to cut down the number of admirals in their battles. Uh, it's one of the interesting things that you start, that you will see, usually in the battles which come after this, most other navies will be having far more admirals in their formations and far more senior officers than the Royal Navy. And this, to an extent, is part of two reasons. One, the British start cutting down to the ones who are actually quite good at their job and being a bit more selective. But two, it's a conscious understanding that people the rank of Admiral cause issues for other people the rank of Admiral. And whilst you need a certain number to coordinate a force, you don't want too many because they'll spend more time arguing with each other and ignoring each other than they will actually cooperating with each other. Unless you're very lucky and you end up with a Nelson and Collingwood, who actually can work together, because they realise they're two sides of the same coin, and they work well under that understanding. Oh, I know. It's a it's a fun thing. It's the Battle of Texiel is one of those battles which is is um is one of those battles which, frankly. You have to wonder why it didn't go better than it did. It could have gone better for both sides, but it didn't. Because, honestly, the Reuter could have taken advantage of the breakdown in the communication. But he didn't on the Allied side. And he, if he managed to stop Rupert getting the centre back to Sprague's rear and actually stopping them combining, then he could have probably defeated in detail at least one part of the British of the British fleet. But it doesn't manage to due to the technology and the difficulties of the time. So De Reuter definitely managed to achieve the strategic victory, and as I say, I reckon the tactical victory. But again, here's the thing. Those 2,000 people lost to the British, uh, to the Allied fleet, and those 1,000 lost to the Dutch. On the Dutch side, it's something like 70% are lost in ships under the direct command of Trump attacking Sprague. And on the Allied side, it's somewhere in the region of 40%. So, pretty much on both sides, you've got 800 men killed because of a personal vendetta between two egos. Sorry, I know I'm ranting at this one, but it just... It's just silly. It is just silly. Right, so where else to find me? Ooh, Twitter, Patreon, and Globe Maritime Ministry. At the moment, here's the interesting stats, and I will read them out from the Patreon, because I have them in front of me. So the September Patreon Choice videos.
we have Force K has currently got 11 votes. The RN, how the RN counted e votes in English Channel has got 10 votes. Abdiel Class Mine Layers uh, have got 8 votes. Uh, support of the Iron Duke and Guerrillas RN and RM operations during the Peninsula War, 9 votes. The Battle of Basque Roads and the Political Fallout, 5 votes. And the non-military roles of the Royal Navy, Diplomacy, Disaster Relief Act, have also got five votes. Now, remember, as far as I know, it's set up that everyone can cast three votes. That's what I tried to set it up. So everyone can pick, basically go, these are the three I'd really like. Uh, these are the three, any of these three I'd really like. So click on them. Um, but it's fun. And so far... 48 votes have been cast, and I have 59 patrons. So, you know, there's another 11 votes to come, and that everything could change. Honestly, everything could. Um, I have to say, I'm surprised the fast mine layers aren't doing better. But Force K could be fun, and e boats are always cool. Apparently, we have a chat rate of three. I'm not really sure. Most recently available time. Hmm. Not sure what that means. Thank you, everyone. And how many died because BT thought it was best to have speed of fire rather than safety? Oh, uh, again. You have these things with admirals. In happy. Might the rivalry between De Reuter and the younger Trump not be one of those reasons that the latter went on charging for glory? I wouldn't call it a rivalry. For it's a rivalry, it should have gone both ways. De Reuter honestly considered Trump a bit of an idiot. Trump thought he should be in charge because he was far more aristocratic. It's kind of like Sprad. Uh, I, I should be in charge because I'm amazing, not the Rupert. Well, frankly, if I had to pick between Rupert and Sprague, I'm going to pick Rupert every time. And that's knowing Rupert's faults. Um, but between Trump and De Reuter, I would pick De Reuter. Between Trump and Bankert, I'd pick Bankert. Between Trump and Van Nussen, I'd pick Van Nussen. Between Trump and Isaac Swears, I'd pick Isaac Swears. Trump, I do consider, is a good admiral and good naval commander. But honestly... I would prefer anyone else than him for the Supreme Command, because he does treat battle and war as this pursuit of personal glory and personal glorification. And frankly, I don't want that for my Supreme Commander. For my Supreme Commander, I need someone who's going to be able to put the needs of the nation and the strategic necessity above the needs of himself. And that's a trouble. Trump's never going to do that. Pretty Vega. The fortunate was the fault of. Oh, Sprague and Trump were equally appreciated for that one. They were equally. Um, she used the French there. B a t s h i t. Um, C r a z z y. When it came to um that particular scenario, sure, Mac. Oh, I forgot to say hello. Hello. Just focused on trying to fix the Luddite riots and rare earth crisis in democracy. Oh, good fun with that one. Richard Hughes. I. Don't vote. <laughs> go vote. If you're on Patreon, go vote. you got three votes. At least. I'm not sure if the system is working right at the moment. When I tested it first time, I had six votes. Then it only counted three of them. So, you know. Carmen Gasman, speaking of not presuming things, is the Adriatic Order still standing? Um, I think you might be pleasantly surprised in September in some of the deep dives that are going to be coming up because I'm basically preparing to record a week of little videos which will be covering for when in September I'm hopefully going wandering because my plan is to go wandering for a few days at least 
to um, go see my girlfriend for her birthday. If I'm allowed out and if there isn't a some form of, I don't know, more lockdown or anything like that. So, because trouble is, she's one end of the country and I'm this end of the country. And uh, I have to drive up to see her. Issues. I can't register on Patreon. That's annoying. Karen Frederick Vega, how's your office building doing? We're going to hear. Um, this is actually a fun thing. So, if we hear in three weeks from Lugard, who are the company who we've ordered it from, that it's going to be, or it's going to come across in time for it to be set up at the earliest potential date, which is the end of September, all through to the end of October, and you find that period, um, then I have a plan for doing a special all-nighter for the Battle of Taranto, which will literally run real-time, and um, our, we've actually got an idea for doing a bilge pump special live on YouTube for it. But that's if it arrives on time. So everyone, please cross fingers with me and look at that Lugard deliver it to us on time. Uh, it would be very nice if they do. We've ordered it from, coincidentally, a Dutch company because it was the best one on offer to suit me and my sister. And it's a very nice little setup. And I will be building, as I said, a Marine Ply. Basically, they are. We've got to have the base and electrics and everything laid on and set up for it. And it's going to have it. They supplied a pack and it's going to be built up for us. So it'll be assembled in a day because the whole team will be there and rather than me trying to figure it out. And then I'm going to build the internals. And so the idea is that whenever there are going to be about two weeks of deep dives scheduled, and deep dives are going to be about 20 minute long videos. And the thing is, they are going to have uh, th those sort of that during that week, I will hopefully be doing the internals. But that's making sure as long as Lugard delivers on time. So if anyone actually does have any connections with Lugard and can possibly give them a kick and tell them to deliver it on time to us, that would be good because then we will do, I, as I said, I have plans. Because you see, the thing is, if we do it in that scenario, at in the sort of my garden sort of thing we can go on all night and we won't disturb anyone and it won't cause any trouble and it, it's easier for, on the social distancing and all these things because it's only the two of us involved and we're not you know two uh, two can make it and then we put jamie up on the screen or something so we uh, we can work all these things out if we can get it to work out properly but it could be fun for the battle of toronto to do that so that's our plan if everything works Hmm. Richard Hughes, I support two channels on YouTube. This is one. Thank you, Richard. Jeff, um, so between Trump and Trump, you would possibly choose Sprague's wife? Yes! <laughs> very, very, if it's late, will the Taranto be delayed or scrapped? The Taranto will be different. I will probably do it the night before. Uh, we'll probably organize something different. But um, it's the thing of we, uh, there'll still be something done for Toronto. But instead of being able to do a live overnight for the 80th anniversary, um, we won't be able to do that. Danny Freeman, would you be doing Toronto on Italy time or GMT? Uh, we'll be running it on the, at the real time as it was run at the time. So, basically, we'll be running in time it was available then. And the fleet time the Royal Navy was running was uh, Eastern Mediterranean time. Uh, was Eastern Mediterranean time. Let's check. Which is a difference of...
so it'll be running from a pretty much 11 a 11 p.m till 5 a.m roughly if we run it live it will be fun if we can do it That's our plan. So it's Plus one hour in sort of British standard uh, summertime, but it's it'll be two hours ahead by October after the clocks go back, I think. Or maybe one hour ahead. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll, I'll work it out closer to time to make sure it works perfectly. But um, yeah, they have fun with the time changing things on me. Uh, Danny Freeman, will you have to make airplane noises for the whole six hours? I will try not to. I will try not to, but we might do. We might have, we're, we're planning on sort of, we'd like to have some models and all sorts of things. Um, Frederick Berg, we will, you're setting a precedent which we will beg you to repeat in other battles. We'll see how this one goes. Gemma, in need, uh, need to plan according to concepts to lessons now. If I want to survive 12 to 11 on this line. <laughs> oh. It will be a fun thing. The thing is, it will be a very fun thing to do, but we do need... We need to be able to set up that space, and we need that space. So, so that's basically cross fingers for me. And Hi, Carl. And it's... It'll be a good thing. If it can arrive on time and all be built, that'll be good. Plan is to have hardware internet access and all sorts of things set up, so it'll be really nicely set up and really able to run, but it's all a lot easier if it has been set up. And actually, I think I've just decided what my four random books are going to be for one of my um, things. Man, no, it, it is fun. Like, this battle is a lot of fun. It, I, I like doing these battles. This one is technically, I'm a day early for the anniversary of this one. And I did consider putting it on the Friday. But I thought, frankly, it's easy to keep to try and comment the constant days. And I do slip around on the Monday and Tuesday, depending on whether it's the patron or me. But I try and keep the Thursday fairly constant. So this is a day off early. The Battle of Tech Seal takes place tomorrow. So that's why it's got nothing there of this is 300 or so years since. Well, it takes place tomorrow. Uh, Jeff Biller, are, for, are we focusing on naval battles or are we adding the land war and lack of an air war? Oh, we're focusing on everything. You have to. It's only fair to focus on everything. Uh, need to make sure if it's authentic Bristol Pegasus sound, though. No fobbing off of Merlin. Uh, yeah. No fobbing off of Merlin. But we do have some advantages when it comes to sawfish.
quite cute looking aircraft. If the army had done their jobs properly at Crete, the Navy wouldn't have had much uh, excitement. No. I'll check that later, Frederick Vega. Thank you, if you have got problems. Because that's the thing. We like to deliver high-quality stuff, all three of us in the Village Pumps team. And it will be... The Battle of uh, Toronto will be a Bilge Pumps sort of production. It'll be us going... You know, because we're all... <laughs> God, it's one of those battles which really does all three of us go, yes, this is right up our street. This is really stuff we can have a lot of fun with. And there's so much complexity going on. There's so much stuff we can cover. Uh, we're going to have to, we're going to try and get some interviews added in and all sorts of things we can do and have it going. So it could be very cool if we can get it right. Although I do worry about how many people will be up that late at night to watch us for those hours. Come on, Gavin. Cretan Tranto, did ever a Fiat CR42 get into a dogfight with Swordfish? Uh, not to my knowledge, but prob possibly. I don't think at Cretan Taranto. Um, at Taranto, they didn't manage to meet any, any air defense, really. They, they literally they caught the Italians completely unawares. Daniel Phillips, victory at sea from Warlord is looking really good for recreating theoretical naval agents, and also they have swordfish modules, models. Ooh. It's a good thing. So, it will be fun. Um, so I will say that much on this thing. If we do get to do the YouTube, that will be a lot of fun. It'll be a lot of enjoyment, for uh, definitely for me. And the Anglo-Dutch War is a lot of interesting. Again, I'm going to reiterate on the battles of Schoenveld. If anyone wants to look at them, the dictionary next to them phrase, not how not to fight a, a, a battle at sea. Schoenveld is just... I know I've been saying this about the Battle of Texiel, but compared to the Battle of Texiel, Schoenveld is even worse. Actually, no. Compared to the Battle of Schoenveld, Texiel is a well-run battle. With well organized, well disciplined commanders. Jeremy, yes, after the few last streams, it's nicely showing evolution. Spanish Armada, era of dedicated warship birth, Battle of Texiel, era of professional navy birth, sort of. Yeah. It's basically when they're going, hang on, we have a problem here. We're investing all this money and we're not getting what we want out of it. Jeff Hill, if Churchill had not interfered, there would have been no Battle of Crete. An example of strategic overstretch. Churchill kept trying to set up 19th century lines of Torres Vedras in the 20th century. To be honest, there is one place in the entire world where the 19th century lines of Torres Vedras actually would have worked. And they weren't used. Malaya. There is one place in the entire world where the enemy doesn't have enough tanks, doesn't have enough artillery, doesn't have enough logistics, that actually lines of defense like Torres Vedras would have worked. And they don't do it there. And Malaya and Singapore fall. And it just... Why? <sighs> yeah. Sure, Mac. Victory at Sea is a lot of fun stop playing you know, when I crashed the game because I tried to get screenshot of my whole fleet at the other together. Ooh. Store World Wall of Games. For £80, you get amongst everything else. Free tribal class destroyers. Mm. Jeff Hill, Skinveld is professionals on home turf versus amateurs. It's professionals on home turf who ba barely move. Just watching the amateurs bugger up. Excuse the range. Do 
Just good. I get the feeling Dr. Clark is in a ranty mood today. Not really, but there are sometimes, how do I put it? Some operations I look at and I go, why? And yes, to an extent, it's easy for me. It is easy for me. I'm not there. I'm not making decisions at the time. One of the I'm getting looked back with 2020 vision of what happened. But there is also the scenario that you get getting looked back allows you to look at things and go, but you knew this and you knew this and you weren't doing this. And yes, you the people at the time. I, I hate it when people second guess the rule. I know this is what I'm doing. What people were making decisions at the time. Because you never have the full perception of what they do on the information they're receiving at the time and what's going through their minds. But Schoonveld, no. And the Battle of Malaya, the Battle of Crete. Even at the time, everyone admits this is being very badly done. And Crete doesn't even have the advantage that they can go with Malaya. Well, it wasn't exactly our first team. Crete are theoretically the first team. They're, they're theoretically the, be the, the best the, the British forces are available. Yes, they've just been kicked out of Greece. And yes, they've been ba bashed up. But they're supposed to be the first team. And the, the problem is this. If you are the best... and Terry Pratchett put this best. Puts this uh, the best, uh, most accurately. If you're the best, you always have to be the best. Otherwise, you're not the best. Okay. He's doing when Death, is, well Mort, is talking to. I think it's Nanny Ogg's son, who's a blacksmith, and Farrier. And he's fixing the hooves, and he's doing it blindfold on Death's horse. He has to do it blindfold so he doesn't see death and doesn't die. And he says, my lord, what happens someday if I have to take my eyes off to check? And my, this my lord, well, then you'll no longer be you, because you'll no longer be the best, because the pest doesn't need to do this. Well, that's the same with the British force at Crete. And they are good troops. It's not the troops who are at fault. It's their commanders who are seemingly unprepared again for the realities of modern war. And you think, you've been through Norway, you've been through Northern Europe campaign with in France, you've been through Greece, you've seen what's going in North Africa. How can you be shocked by the sudden appearance of these systems? Why are you so bad at organising this? And it's... Mm. And some units do really, really well against the invasion at Crete. And some units do really, really terrible. And they chuck some units in who should never have been chucked in. You know, the the chucking in of lay force. Oh, my God. Why are you sending in commandos? It's like when I see the things today and you've got, oh, yeah, don't worry. We've put the SAS at the front of our lines. We'll never have to fight a battle. Yes, you will. Because the SAS are elite light troops. They're brilliant light troops, but they're going to... It's not that long before you can actually... If someone's prepared and knows they're coming, that they can have enough firepower they can deal with the SAS. Because the whole point of the SAS is you're not supposed to know they're coming. They hit fast where you're not expecting them. They overwhelm, and then they get out of there. If you've got them at the front of your column, charging in ahead of the main infantry coming in... Their basic job is to start and mark targets for air power because if they're trying to fight, they're going to get overwhelmed because you know they're coming. You're going to have prepared defense positions. You're going to have a lot of heavy armor there. Those are things they're not designed for fighting. It's not that's not saying SAS aren't great. They are. That's just not the scenario they're designed for, and you're using them and in the wrong scenario.
Danny Human, I have a whole range of issues, but rather than sque try to squeeze it into 200 characters, apparently I get video time. Yes, we will record it tomorrow. Basically, it was, uh, it was going to be a case of, I need to do this. Well, it worked quite well last time with Daniel, so we'll see if Daniel's free. <clears throat> That's good. Sounds a lot like what happened with Marine Recon in Second World War. Exactly what happened with Marine Recon in Second World War. Don't use your light infantry assets to get overwhelmed. The tip of your spear, it's one of the things when I'm talking to people about, and they're going... Ah, reconnaissance is about finding information. Yes, it is. You should never fight for information when you're doing reconnaissance. It tells the enemy what you know. But there's a code assault on that. And I have a lot of problems with the Ajax vehicle being used as a reconnaissance unit for the strike brigades or for infantry brigades. It's too big. And it's not fast enough for them. But it's perfect for reconnaissance for a heavy armor brigade. Because a heavy armor brigade is, is recce is uh, if you're using a heavy armor brigade properly, it's probing around and heading into heavy armor. That's probably what it's going to be fighting. It's going to be going into combat. For that, Ajax is the best unit for going into those sort of areas because you need to be quite heavily armored armed because you're going to be facing quite heavy armored opposition. I have to say, I might do a video on the lines of Taurus Vedras at some point, because I think it'd be quite fun to do. Also, I think half the reason there are so many pa uh, paintings going around of the Battle of Tech Seal is because Crump commissions them. I would just like to point this one out. Also, uh, there is one story I read, which is that in Trump's huge... Ship shaped like pal uh, the house he builds in the Netherlands manor house. Um, that there isn't a single room which doesn't have a painting of him in, and that just wouldn't surprise me. But I haven't ever been there to check. Kilo 19. Hello, hope you're well. Mm-hmm. So, it's an interesting old time. It is an interesting old time. And Texiel is the big lesson I took away from this is the importance of communication and the importance of. It's wondering. Uh, it's going to sound strange. I think this is possibly where the origins of the captains' meetings start to come about. You know, the band of brothers, the meeting between the admiral and his captains before it on the eve before a battle and these sort of things, or beginning of an operation, so explains instructions. I think that is one of the scenarios where this comes about and where the Admiral has not just his own immediate subordinates, but all his subordinates on his flagship to discuss the things. It's a big risk, but in a limited communication time, it makes sense. And it's something which Bing does. That's John, not George. Um, so, you know, it makes sense. That's exactly, uh, Shromack, that's exactly what I say about the Bradley. It's clearly terrible because it's not the same si the size of the weasel. Never mind that. The Bradley has dismounts, which will be smaller than any amount of vehicle. It's clearly terrible recon. It, you see, the thing is, it's terrible at recon if you're using it for recon for units which are small mid. If it's the heavy firepower vehicle of your unit, and actually at the moment, as we're looking at the strike brigades, the Ajax is going to be the light cavalry armoured unit of the brigade. Don't 
There is a good theory around it. There are some people like Wilfred Owen who have done a lot of work on it. And if you want to look up some good stuff on the future of armed warf warfare, Wilfred Owen is a definite person to look up. Frankly, most of his stuff is really, really cutting edge and amazing. Uh, he does. He, he has a lot of fun and a lot of work on it. But the one point I will say is that I think the British Army has a has had some good ideas for the Strike Brigade. I think the execution of it has been muddled by the time it's taken and by the minister, the various politicians involved in it. And I think half the trouble that hands with procurement these days is that you have so many short-term decisions made during what is a very long-term process. Procurement and transition of forces is a long-term uh, process of 20, 30, 40 years. Take care, Jay. See you Sunday for brew ships. Come on, come on. Sean Mac, you mean the German Wiesel tankette? They are cute, those little things. Um, I prefer the CVRTs. I liked the... Sc uh, honestly, the Scorpion was fun to drive. Scimitar was pretty darn cool. I liked those little vehicles. I thought they were a very good development line. I'm sorry that... I thought they were just enough... Tough enough compared to the Weasel that I would prefer to be in them in, co in this scenario, but they were small enough and fast enough they could get where they needed to go. Sure, Matt. Just to be clear, I was reciting the tired line of people. Yeah, I, I guess that. Um, the face value. But the thing is, the thing is uh, as I said, those larger recon vehicles actually have a role in the larger, heavier reconnaissance of the heavier units. But it's when your reconnaissance assets are your heaviest combat units of your brigade, that's when you've got the things the wrong way around. Because the whole thing about a strike brigade is they're supposed to be able to move very fast at high speed. In the nicest way, the boxer is probably the boxer units are probably going to be overtaking and outpacing the striker unit, the Ajax units, unless the Ajax, even if the Ajax are on trailers. Um, until they get off them and they're off r on rough terrain, and then the Ajax are probably going to get this. Just oh, no. It's a. It's like when we're talking this period. One of the interesting things again you find. What is mentioned in the Dutch fleet? They have advice yachts. And they are literally, their job is to pass information around, signals around, and organization. That's really quite useful. Take care, RF4. What do you think about the Puma? I think it's a nice idea. Honestly, the Pumas are another in the genera current generation of IFVs. Frankly, they're all they've all taken the various basic same ideology and are starting to improve it on it. There are some really, really good um, Israeli designs. There are some really good designs going around for infantry fighting vehicles, but I think they're all getting very, very heavy. Daniel Freeman, I think the Ajaxes and Boxers need to be different brigades. Ajax supporting tanks and warriors, Boxers in mechanical infantry. See, the thing is, I would say the Warrior is your mechan mechanized infantry brigade. The Boxer is your motorized slash strike brigade. And the Ajaxes are in your armored brigade with your tanks. And probably some Warriors. But we're not going for that. We're going for um, uh, all sorts of interesting things. But on my sort of world, it would be one heavy cavalry regiment, heavy cavalry battalion, 
three mechanized infantry battalions and a light cavalry battalion per brigade for an armed brigade and just go, right then, you want to fight us? Because Britain's never going to build more divisions than anyone else at the moment. That's just not going to happen in peacetime. But in war, uh, we could build brigades which are strong enough that a single armoured brigade of the British turns up and that's a case of, okay, you've got a lot of firepower to have to deal with here. That is a combat. That is good. Uh, that is scary. And I, as I've said before, I would like the idea of strike amphibious brigades. But we're getting far off away from Texiel. But it's also rather appropriate for Texiel because Texiel, remember, is a battle fought with the idea of getting control of the sea so you could do an amphibious operation. That's the point. It was to get control of the sea so you could do an amphibious operation into the Dutch rear and basically take them out so that even though they'd flooded the Netherlands, they couldn't stop the war. Dirt Squad, have you ever seen the film Pentagon Wars? Uh, a while back, yeah. Ben Freeman, uh, ah, semantics. I'd say Warriors Armored Infantry and goes with tanks and CVRT for replacement, which the CVRT replacement is the Ajax. Uh, Daniel Freeman, mechanized motorized infantry wouldn't have tanks, but could be all wheeled quite usefully. Uh, Carl Gasman, the Hungarian gun side, the license producing and purchasing lynxes. I hope that will be an amphibious version offered to Australia too. Kelly 19, think the challenge is going through life extension process. Yes, it is. Another one. Um, honestly, because <sighs> buying a new tank fleet in Britain would be very incredibly contentious. Mainly because Britain, uh, there's a lot of people who are not quite sure why you have the tank force. Well, the tank force, the ar you have the armed brigade for the same reason you have the carrier battle group. Because when you need it, you really need it. And your carrier battle group is your theatre entry force. Your tank, uh, your armoured brigade is your theatre entry force. In terms of once you've plotted down your forces, and usually, here's the thing. Okay, so your strategic entry forces are, honestly, they're your carrier battle group and your amphibious task group. Because then you can land a marine brigade or an amphibious task unit. You can take an area and you can start bringing in more units. I'm sorry, but having seen how many boxes... How many A400s are needed to move? How many uh, two? It's three A400s are needed to move two boxes now. Three aircraft to move two vehicles. You know, this is how heavy now. It's going. If you're going to move a brigade anyway, you're going to be doing it by sea. I, I I hate to upset people on this one, but that's the thing. You are going to be doing it, and that's not anyone's fault. It's the sheer weight of the vehicles and. Honestly, you don't want to be flying something galaxy-sized into the middle of a war zone in live firing. It just wouldn't be fun. But, and I say this with all the things, you get, you've got your strategic theatre entry, but then once you're on a shore, you probably do load up with another strike brigade, but, and you load up with a mechanised infantry brigade. But you need that armor brigade because once the armor brigade is ashore, then you can break out and you can start doing what you need. That's your land fear to entry. You've managed to get your strategic fear to entry, your regional entry force. You're, you've got into the sea area, you've got all that. But once you're ashore, you're ashore and you didn't have to break out from there. That's where your armor brigade comes in because they are the juggernaut, which once they get going, it's very difficult to stop them. Then you need a strike brigade. Once they busted a hole, strike brigade goes through. And they've got heavy cavalry, push out the enemy. Mech infantry, block and hold. Strike brigade, ghost charge. That's your complete force. That's a coherent idea. Mm. It is, you sort of have some towed guns and these sort of things in reserve. It is. 
Back in a second. So lots of things going on here about various artilleries. So we have officially gone well off the back of all the tech seal amount. Uh, we're talking about reconditioning of ships. Well, you can do a lot with reconditioning of ships. You can't do as much as sometimes you'd like to think you can do, but you can do a lot. And honestly, the Royal Navy needed to have done more. They could have uh, done with actually having a faster, more aggressive reconditioning process. But of course, there were operational com commitments in the interwar period, which Brent and they couldn't. And there was also financial reasons they couldn't. Ah, uh, yes. No worry. Um, and I have to say, I would agree with Daniel Freeman's point. I think the British Army could do with a whole family of wheeled vehicles for things like combat engineers. If you remember the CVRTs, they were a whole family. That was the thing about them. They were like cavalry, but they were a whole family. Or rather medium for their in, in, in the beginning period. They were a whole family of vehicles. They had a mine layer. They had an anti-tank variant. They had an armored reconnaissance variant. They have an ambulance, a command variant. All sorts of different ver vehicles. They, are good. they were a good system when they were designed. Right then. So, I am going to say I'm going to finish it at 9 o'clock as we're so far off topic. But any questions on Tech Seal? Any stuff about Tech Seal that you're sort of wondering about? Anything you want to talk about these very swanky looking Dutch commanders? The Reuter, Trump. And brank, uh, banquet. Come on, guys, man. Read Tech Seal. They use rockets to communicate and harm each other. Well, they see the thing is, this is one of the interesting things. Um, not so much to harm each other, but they did try, apparently. This was in one of the reports I read. I'm not quite 100% sure on this. To use rockets to send off signals, but it didn't really seem to work. The idea was anything which could get in a position which you could be seen. But the trouble is a rocket goes up in daytime, booms up, you've got some smoke and coloured smoke and that sort of thing. 
doesn't really work that great. It's very much the initial period of experimenting in this scenario. Flags were definitely being used to communicate. Not all that well, but they were being used. Blind Freeman, would the Expeditionary Army Force, Blackheath Army, have actually been able to accomplish anything, or would it have just wandered around for a bit, died from disease, and been bounced by the Dutch? Well, the thing is, it was large enough the Dutch would have to detach a force to go deal with it. It would have possibly been beaten, but the thing is, the moment the Dutch detached the force to go deal with it, they would have to weaken their positions versus the French, and the French might be able to make it across the flooded floodplains and attack them. So that's the thing. If you, uh, it, it wasn't big enough on its own to defeat the Dutch army. Definitely not big enough on its own. And there is also the scenario that after it had landed, if it secured enough airspace, more troops could arrive from elsewhere. The French might rapidly move some troops in by sea and all these things. When you have sea control, you can do that. But what it would do, and most certainly would do, is distract the Dutch enough that they would have to make decisions about what they were going to do with the forces available. Come on, mate. Sure, Mac. But nowadays, when a dinky 40 millimeter underbarrel frenade launcher, a grenade launcher, gets um, rocket assisted laser guided ammo, not kidding, even the definitely, no, uh, definitely so 20th century grad like stuff can be viable. Mm, yeah. It is quite interesting, some of the new stuff coming in. We are looking at the personal soldier becoming far, far more potent. But the trouble is, again, they're having to work on how to upgrade their sensor systems because you have that old adage. Your weapons are starting to outgrade, out, out, um, how to put it, out qualify your sensors. And that is a problem for the infantry, a problem for ground troops because of the weight. Interesting thing will be to see if exoskeletons manage to actually make it practical and viable. Take care, Carl. Um, Apollo, if U.S. Marine Corps goes ultramarines, um, uh, I, I'd be very worried if I were anyone fighting them. Turning 3434. Hello. Anybody already addressed Martin Trump? Um, well, I have basically called him. Well, I've call, uh, called Cornelius Martin Trump a bit of a twango. Uh, Martin Trump is a good one. But that, that's half the trouble because you have the different Trumps. And one Trump is good. One Trump is not as good as his press makes him out to be.
So Martin it, Trump is, of course, uh, Cornelius is Trump's petter mm -hmm. and is a very, very good admiral. And a very good commander. And it's partially because of his experience as Supreme Commander in 1637 and various other times that, to an extent, Trump thinks he should, uh, Cornelius Trump thinks he should be in charge of everything. So, basically, because his dad was good and in charge, he thinks sh he should be in charge. <sighs> But honestly, again, I when I'm saying those list of 17th century admirals, um, I should probably clarify. My number five Trump is Martin, not Cornelius. But Cornelius does get up there into the ten. But he's good. Martin is good, definitely. Right. Angus Sonner, the Dutch. Uh, mm. Turning 3434, four. Martin Trump showed the rotor the ropes. Unfortunately, Cornelius didn't pick it up. No, Cornelius thought his name counted for more than his ability. Well, no, he thought his ability was counted for more because of his name. It's quite confusing. Uh, he, he is obsessed with his name and being the great Trump. Frederick Vega, why no ship sunk? L uh, luck, not enough damage? Uh, honestly, the fire ships proved inaccurate and they don't have enough real firepower to start sinking ships. This is the thing. These are not yet the cannon. That's not the reason why I say this is not really the age of sail. This is not the rater fleet that you we we associate with the age of sail this is the transition period this is still the age of sail it's like why were so few ships sunk during the armada when they were firing each other so long that's why angerson the dutch flooded the lands to keep the french army could they have done this in world war ii to keep the germans out they probably would have tried but they didn't manage to get the time Turning 3434, also Trump fought non line battles. De Reuter copied that tactic when the British started to use them against the Dutch fleet. Yes. I think you're talking about Martin Trump. Uh, did that. Come on, why sink there when there is a boarding part, a boarding of prize money? That is definitely a consideration. Ben Freeman, Dr. Clark, Bridget Vega, I think it's likely because the light, lighter weight of artillery carried, and given how many ships were disabled, they're probably shooting above the waterline. Uh, they were mostly seem to be shooting for the rigging. Apollo, how come was it during the textile period for the ships to have 50 plus a year careers? Like Victory was seen by Nelson when he was a boy. Not unusual. Not unusual at all. In fact, some of these ships would have um, several major rebuilds. Don Eagle, Doug Scott. Before the Battle of Shanghai in 1937, Xing had a plan to trap the Japanese Yangtze squadron with block ships. It was leaked, but how much good would it have done? Well, if he'd done it and managed to succeed it, he'd secured one of his flanks and would have created a problem that the enemy would have had to resolve. So he could have dictated part of the battle, but, you know.
He has a lot of other issues to overcome to actually get a victory. And turning 3434, I, I spoke a bit too soon. The flooded line, the new water lane, uh, water lane was considered obsolete by the 1900s, and the defensive line of East Direct was introduced. Yeah, but it was still used by the Germans in World War II. It wasn't as good as it was, but it was still there. Um, Nerits have 50 years service already. Uh, pretty good, but how many times have the, the planes they carry changed? Quite a lot. And this is the thing an aircraft carrier is possibly one of the most flexible, modular ships you can build because its entire weapon system, which is its aircraft largely, are completely changed quite regularly. Uh, if you consider the air group when Shows how long I've been spent leaning on these today. I've got starting to get red marks on my elbows. Um, the air group when the and uh, when the Nimitz is into service, it's based around intruders and phantoms. By the time they're still in service today, and now it's all based on F-18s and F-35s are coming in. In that time, they've had Tomcats, they've had the original F-18s. They've had all sorts. They've gone through almost arguably four different generations of aircraft. Calvin Gasman, I guess the ex Soviet Baku now Vikram, uh, Vikramantia will see her 50th birthday in service, I guess. Yep. Technically, Nimitz is 48, as Daniel Freeman has just pointed out, and Frederick Vega has pointed out, because she commissioned in 72. But, you know, not far. And for escorts, they're usually, that is the missile systems which are changing around, but I doubt many of them will get to. Okay, there are probably some escorts which are former British ones which are in service in South American nations which have got for 50 years and Hermes, etc. But, um, yeah. They've had a fair number of fair, quite long careers. Um, Belgrano had her career cut short in the prime of her life. Anyway, it's nine o'clock, so I'm going to go and... Take the fluffy research assistant for a walk. Thank you very much to everyone. I hope you've had a nice evening. Sorry about the beginning. Um... <laughs> In future, I will double check the blue button. So thank you, Daniel. Daniel Fre Frederico. Thank you, Golden Eagle. Thank you, Apollo. Thank you, Jermak. Thank you, Angus. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, um, Sean. Thank you, Turning 3434. Thank you, Joshua Peters, um, who I haven't got to your interesting points on the gy uh, gyro jet, but that's because I was trying to focus on the Battle Tech Seal, but I do enjoy that one. Um, thank you to Derp Squad. Thank you to Richard Hughes. Thank you to Kilo19, RF4. Thank you to Jay Ellingworth. Thank you to Jeff Beeler. Thank you to Carl. Thank you to Do -do 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 -do. In Happy. Thank you to Richard Hughes. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, everyone, basically. And thank you, everyone, for watching. It's always nice to have people watching.
night night and well thank you take care on thank you greg take care Oh, thank you, Nicole. <laughs> yes, it will be a fun walk with a fluffy research assistant. He does deserve it. And considering his life name is Raleigh, um, although I do call him the fluffy research assistant whenever I'm talking about him often. Um, yeah. So really, he should have been around for this one, but he, he should more of likely have been around for the Spanish Armada one. He'd have enjoyed that. Anyway, thank you, everyone. Take care, and have a nice evening. Thank you. And so that Drac and Jamie don't tell me off, please do like, share, and subscribe if you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thank you. Have you a nice evening. Thank you, Yikas.